ังของวัดฮิกฤษเสียมเรียบแคมปูเดียเ
In spite of his success, Suryavarma II is a usurper king who seized the throne by murder. If he does not want to get overthrown by enemies opposed to his rule, he must establish his position as a god king in the eyes of his people. This is very common all over the world. In every culture, a king who has slightly dubious CV will impose himself uh, with his architecture and his art to, to prove that he really was chosen by the gods. He certainly did that at Angkor. Consulting with his priests and advisors, Surya Varman pursues an aggressive plan. He starts by selecting the Hindu god Vishnu as his patron. His choice sends a powerful message, since Vishnu is invoked by other kings in times of war. To honor his divine protector, Surya Varman will construct an elaborate religious complex. This would not be built of wood like any normal Khmer building. Because wood, like man, perishes. To transform their kings into gods, the Khmer use a material that will last for eternity. They build their temples in stone. Building temples is one way that Khmer kings can demonstrate their power. And they will build more than 700. But Surya Varman wants his masterpiece to surpass them all. It will be the largest temple in the Khmer Empire. Angkor Wat. As befits his ambition, Surya Varman's plan is godlike in scale. Angkor Wat will reproduce on Earth the world of the gods in every detail. The Hindu conception of heaven was Mount Meru, and Mount Meru occupied a mythical place somewhere north of the Himalayas. And there there were five mountain peaks where the gods lived. Here you had to reconstruct that. So, at the center is an enormous temple mound, topped by five towers soaring 65 meters above the floodplain. This is known as the Temple Mountain. The Temple Mountain was clearly a place of worship, but it may also have had another, equally sacred purpose. The building presents conflicting clues. It is dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, yet it features Surya Varman II's posthumous name, Parama Vishnu Loka. It faces due west, the compass point associated with Vishnu, but also the direction of death. When the king became king, the first thing in mind that he had was when he died he had to go to heaven, and so here they had to reconstruct literally heaven on earth and there was a, a, already a massive project he had a large army of architects he had his priests he had his soothsayers he had everybody organized from the word go to build this massive complex so that on death he went straight to heaven Hayam believes that Surya Varman planned this complex as his gateway to the afterlife like the pyramids in Egypt the temple should be completed before the god king dies if not he might not join the gods in heaven. This was unthinkable. But just clearing the site amid the steamy rainforest is the first challenge. Because the area it covers is huge, some 500 acres. It's hard to get your head around how big 500 acres is. For engineer Ed McCann, the scale of this place is staggering. 500 acres is about the size of 250, 300 football pitches. It's not just the size of the site that is daunting. The construction hurdles are equally formidable. And this will be covered with trees that are from this sort of size to, you know, meters in diameter of hard tropical wood. They've got a few machetes and maybe an axe or two, and they've got to chop their way through this in the middle of steaming heat and bugs and beasties everywhere. And this would have been a mammoth task, an absolutely mammoth task to clear this area. Like most of Cambodia, Angkor sits on a flat waterlogged plain. But it is the capital of the Khmer Empire 
And to boost his prestige, Suryavarman needs to build here. So his men must erect millions of blocks of stone in the middle of a flat flood plain where there's no quarry. And he must do it in a monsoon plague swampland, which will somehow support his megastructure for nearly a thousand years. Surya Varman II's temple, Angkor Wat, will soar above Cambodia larger than any medieval cathedral. And his engineers have less than a single lifetime in which to build it. I'm a stonemason by trade, and I still haven't really worked out how they did it. That temple was built in probably about 35 years. Now, the only cathedral in England, for instance, that was built in such a short time is Salisbury. Most cathedrals took up to 200, 300 years, and they're considerably smaller than Angkor Wat. Because the temple is sacred, it has to be built on pure soil. This meant that the dirt was to be excavated down several meters. It is backfilled with thick layers of sand and topped with stones. A final layer of sand is added to level the surface. But all this will be for naught unless they can secure the favor of the gods who will reside in the temple. So, before they start building, they select an auspicious day in the calendar. Priests call out to the gods for their blessings. They dip cords in colored powder. With these, they lay down mandalas. The mandala patterns represent heaven, symbolically binding the gods to the site and ensuring their blessings on the temple. At the core of the temple are these offerings. The white sapphire represents the moon, while the gold leaf signifies the sun. The two elements are buried. Over this location, Surya Varman's engineers will build a shaft leading through the burial chamber to the sacred central chamber above. And the temple mountain is built around this shaft. Created from terraces stacked on top of one another, like three giant sandboxes, the temple mountain is a massive project. With the second and third levels twice as high as the first, on the very top are five peaks, which represent sacred Mount Meru and its companion mountains. The structure will weigh thousands of tons. Surya Varman plans to build this complex in the heart of the city of Angkor. Life here is dominated by the monsoon cycle. The rainfall in this area is highly seasonal. Researcher Damien Evans contends that Cambodia's extreme climate shaped the way that Angkor was built. For six months of the year, you have a, a, an abundance of water, too much water, essentially. Uh, and for the other six months of the year, during the dry season, you don't really have enough water. Also, rainfall varies quite sharply from year to year. In simple terms, with 88% of the rain falling during the monsoon season, the Khmer must stabilize, store, and disperse water for use during the dry season. But the solution is anything but simple. In the 9th century, Khmer engineers began to create an extensive hydraulic system. By the 12th century, hundreds of interconnected canals, dikes, and reservoirs operate over 1,500 square kilometers. The network is like Venice on steroids. It supports an enormous city, covering an area as great as the city of Los Angeles and sustaining nearly one million people. It was by far the largest city in the world until the Industrial Revolution. It's a virtual megalopolis. Architectural conservationist John Stubbs believes that Angkor is more than just a gigantic city. It's a city of cities, with Angkor Wat, the temple, being the centerpiece, like the Vatican is to Rome. And building on this swampy river delta presents a formidable challenge. <laughs> Very difficult conditions to build in. It's flat, of course, which is positive, but you have a water table which is pretty much, at the, in the wet season, is even higher than the level of the ground in that it's usually flooded. That's good if you're growing rice, but it's not good if you're building vast temples. 
Even if they could build a solid foundation into the waterlogged soils, the monsoon cycle, which alternately causes floods and droughts above ground, wreaks havoc on anything constructed here. Underground, the spaces between the soil particles are filled with water as the water table surges up with the monsoon rains. This would uproot foundations and walls. During the drought, the water table drops again, drying the soil and causing it to lose its elasticity and sucking the walls and foundations downwards. This dramatic ebb and flow could rip apart even the strongest buildings. It will take a stroke of engineering brilliance to conquer the forces of nature at work. Instead of building the temple to withstand the impact of surging water, they harness the water to their advantage. Angkor Wat is like a ship floating on an ocean of subterranean water. But the Khmer have a problem. There's only enough water to float on during the rainy season. How will they prevent this ship of stone from settling on the bottom throughout the other months? To keep the temple stable, they must create a reservoir nearby to keep the water table topped up all year round. The secret mechanism that protects the temple lies in one of its most visible features. The moat surrounding Angkor Wat is gigantic. The outside perimeter extends five kilometers and it's 200 meters wide. Its distinctive shape is clearly evident from space. When complete, the moat will collect the runoff of the monsoon rains from the temple site, minimizing the upward surge of the water table. During the dry season, water absorbed by the soil from the moat reservoir keeps the water table constant. High water table forms the foundation upon which the temple is constructed to keep it from sinking into the mud. <laughs>